Good morning. I'm glad that you're here today, and I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving with your family. It's great to uh, be together. So this um, uh, next week on Tuesday, we will start um, a small group for three weeks, reading together Joy of Every Longing Heart. We do have another book out there in the foyer. If you would like to grab one, feel free to do so for that small group. Well, it's a devotional book to read during the Advent season. Advent season starts uh, for us next Sunday as the first Sunday of Advent and uh, goes all the way uh, until Christmas. Also, this is the Sunday I wanted to ask you, let me know whether or not you will uh, be interested in coming back here Christmas Eve for Christmas Eve service that evening. It is on Sunday uh, this, this time, and so either we're going to do some weird hybrid fourth Sunday of Advent Christmas Eve service in the morning or we'll do a fourth Sunday of the Advent service, and then that evening we'll come together, as many churches do on, on Christmas Eve uh, evening, for a candlelight service. And I just wanted to make sure, given our history of often doing our Christmas Eve service the Wednesday before, that uh, uh, there would be availability here. So feel free to let me know. Also, after the service today, we're going to get ready for the Advent season, and so... Uh, after service this morning, feel free to come on downstairs. We, uh, we have some sandwiches, we have some chips, well, just, just a brief, uh, uh, brief meal. And then we're going to transform this sanctuary into its Advent colors and look, and uh, it'll be great. And uh, more hands make for light work, and if you're able to join us, feel free to do that. Uh, what a joy it is to be able to be here and uh, to be able to honor the Lord with you. Let's hear the call to worship and praise Him today. Our call to worship is from Psalm 95. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. And with that, why don't we stand together and worship him in song.
can be seated. Real quick, before we go to prayer, if you have, there's something on your heart that you want to say about how great God is or something you're thankful for about our Lord, I want to give you a chance to do that before we go to prayer. Let it be a part of our preparation activity for prayer. What is a praise that you would like to testify to about who God is to you? Be with all my family. Of course, of course. Always thankful for those moments. I get to be with friends on Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to church. <laughs> Family, strangers can both be blessed company. <laughs> Even in when our family's strange. <laughs> Good. Anything else? Getting to the end of the year, finding I had a couple of extra days off so I could actually spend it with family. There you awesome. go. Yeah. Those little things, yeah. I'm yeah. thankful to God for improvements in health. Yeah. Thank you, Wanda. Good, good. I am thankful, so thankful. That answered prayer, my son starts work tomorrow, and he is so excited. I don't know who's more excited, him or me. But we're both excited. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, let's go to prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do praise you this morning. We thank you for your goodness. You have been great. Lord, uh, these testimonies here come, some with surprise, some with uh, just recognizing where you've been continually faithful, and some as very real answers to prayer. And so, Heavenly Father, I thank you for these words of testimony and that we can come to you and, and honor you this morning. Lord, uh, we do come to you with some prayer requests as well, some prayer requests that have just come up today. So, uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we want to lift up George to you. He has been in the hospital for a couple of days, or we pray for his health. We pray for his recovery. We pray for what the next steps are going to be. Uh, Lord, uh, we pray for others who can't be here today because of their, their sick, uh, Alex and anyone else, Lord, who just uh, under the weather was not able to make it today. Lord, I lift up to you today our, our neighbor, Connie, and uh, pray for uh, her recovery from her fall. Lord, we are lifting up to you today, Jim, as well, uh, uh, Polly's son, who has uh, gone back into the hospital. And Lord, we, you know the details of all of these situations, and you know what's going on, and we are praying for uh, your, your spirit to be there for comfort, but also for your spirit to be there for healing. We trust in you and uh, are thankful we can bring these requests to you. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we come to this place of worship today, that uh, you would be glorified in our lives, that we would come to see indeed that you restore hope, goodness, faithfulness in each and every one of us. And uh, Lord, help us to live according to the way you've called us to live and help us to see that you are at work and your hand is with us wherever we go. Thank you again for this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like to uh, give to the Lord this morning, feel free to bring your offering to the offering plate at the front and we'll honor him through giving.
Good morning. Our first scripture lesson is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people, and his incoming incompatible great power for us who believe that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the, his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and domination, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in, in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills everything in every way. Amen. Good morning. Thank you, Fred. This passage has no hard names or places. <laughs> and a story I know. And really appropriate, Pastor, for this time of year. Matthew 25, 31 to 46, the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a separate she separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, ye who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared to you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, ye who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when do we see you? hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you. He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to the eternal life. Amen. Just stand with me and we'll sing our
Today is Christ the King Sunday. It's it's a time of the year in in the history of the church that we celebrate that Jesus is our Lord, Jesus is King. It It is a way throughout the history of the church. It's been a Sunday, the Sunday before Advent begins, where we wrap up the church year by testifying of God's primary place in our life, of Jesus Christ and what He will do in our life. And and the early church is a way for them to to recognize that uh, despite all the kings that might exist and the kings that they might have, that there is one who is King of kings and Lord of lords, and that is Jesus Christ. And so it, it was understood that by celebrating Christ as King, if there was ever conflict, between the way of the world, there were conflict between what their king told them to do and what Christ calls them to do, that they would obey Christ. And it was a way in which the church helped us remember who we are and to where we belong. Christ the King Sunday is a way of remembering to put God first. And in this day when we don't think about kings very much anymore, unless uh, we're talking about English royalty, maybe. But we don't think about uh, king. We, we don't have them anymore. You know, it is a way in which we remember Christ is first, foremost in our life. That in the same way, then, if there's something in our life that we are realizing is clashing with God's call on our life, that we are to follow the way of Christ and to lift him up as first priority, as king in our life, and to let nothing else stand in the way of God's call for us. I'm going to read for you in a moment from Ezekiel chapter 34. I find ourselves right in the middle of this uh, chapter of this prophet uh, Ezekiel. And this is one of the passages that throughout the history of the church has been one of the traditional passages that, have been sh- that has been shared on Christ the King Sunday, uh, one of about 12 of those passages that d- is shared. And you'll find yourself recognizing, oh, this is very similar to the passage that Brenda read and it has a uh, Uh, coherence with it. But it begins, I want to give you just the opening. Ezekiel is warning the people of God about how they've been living. And he uses the most common kind of analogy. He uses that of shepherds and a sheep. In their pastoral economy, this, this made sense. The largest kind of example of one person having rule and reign or control or, 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 or responsibility for another large group would be that of a shepherd and their sheep. They didn't have the same kind of like mega businesses and super industrial complexes that we have today. So it, we, we can just like just look very easily and find all kinds of businesses that have like a CEO and hundreds or thousands of people underneath them. And uh, so we can get, we can understand that there might be today a different illustration, but before the industrial revelation and before uh, a revolution and before, uh, (laughs) gotta gotta get my words straight there, and before uh, we had, you know, everything as it is today, and there kind of the, the shepherd model was the model of one person who has a large number for which they are responsible for. And at the beginning of Ezekiel chapter 34, the prophet speaks out against the shepherds and says, you have been, other prophets of Israel, you have been assigned a sheep, a flock, the people of God to take care of, to nurture, to nourish, to shepherd, to watch out for, to give the hope of God to them, to proclaim to them the news that God has for them. But instead... He says to the shepherds, you have been getting fat off of slaughtering the choice sheep and leaving the rest to wander and leaving the rest to starve. And you have just been reaping the benefits of destroying the the good ones and leaving the rest to waste away. And it is this critique of a kind of life, a kind of leadership that says, I'm all about me and I want to take the biggest advantage I can and the most influential people who might get in the way, I'm going to cut their legs out from under them and make sure that they can't do that and then everyone else can just kind of waste away. It's a big critique against some poor leadership that happens and was happening during their time. And and continuing with that illustration, of sheep, we will get to the passage. I'm going to read for you starting at verse 11. Uh, The prophet Ezekiel continues to talk about the people of God and how God is going to respond and answer their concerns. Verse 11, thus says the Lord God, I myself will search for my sheep 
and will seek them out. As shepherds seek out their flocks when they are among their scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places to which they've been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. I'll bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries, will bring them into their own land, and I will feed them on the mountains of Israel by the water courses and all the inhabited parts of the land. I will feed them with good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel shall be their pasture. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and they shall feed on rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I will make them lie down, says the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. But the fat and the strong I will destroy. Well, I will feed them with justice. As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the rest of the pasture? When you drink of clear water, must you foul the rest with your feet? Must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have fouled with your feet? Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, I myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep because you pushed with flank and shoulder and butted at all the weak animals with your horns until you scattered them far and wide. I will save my flock, and they shall no longer be ravaged. I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David shall be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. You hear this illustration of the sheep, and you can recognize that if, if you lived in that time, if you understood that, understood that metaphor, it makes good sense. You, you can find yourself imagining how sheep act, whether they're dancing in the water that others wanted to drink in, whether they're wandering off, whether they're headbutting and trying to create their own corners within their pen or within the field. You can kind of imagine the, the troubles that you would have to navigate or perhaps have seen in that time. And he uses this as an illustration for them about how some in the people of God have been taking advantage of others. And he begins by talking about this and laying out to the sheep, I want you to know God is seeking after you. He says uh, at, at the beginning of verse 11, I myself will seek after my sheep. And so we see at the very beginning, God is saying, you've had some bad shepherds who have led you, but I want you to know that I am seeking after you. And that is the beautiful picture of our God is he is always a God who seeks, always a God who is looking for us and how he can penetrate uh, our walls and let us know that He is the God who loves and cares for us. In thinking about God, a conversation I've been having with another lady is, uh, who might doubt, well, how can we come to ever think about God or talk about God? After all, if, if God's so much bigger than I am, then, then anything I might say is just an analogy, isn't it? Isn't it just a projection of who I am? And the beautiful thing about the story of God is that this God, as big, as infinite as he might be, yes, he would be completely outside the bounds of anything we could possibly say, except for this. Our God has desired to be known. And our God finds ways of breaking into our life and, letting, and reminding us and letting us know, I have a plan, I have a purpose, I love you, I care for you. You are important to me. Sometimes people encounter that through uh, a moment they, they realize they've gotten out of predicament they didn't know they could get out of. Maybe it was an accident. Maybe it was an illness. It was, it was a trial that they saw. Some, they, they, they had power to get through that they didn't expect. And they say, I think God was there with me. Maybe it's in a way, a, a beautiful moment where they just feel particularly close and drawn to God. A morning at a sunset, a time holding a baby, a, a, a time in which they realize I've had, I, I've had a moment where I've just felt incredibly close and felt the peace and comfort of God that knows he's there. But our God continues to seek after, to let us know of a plan and a purpose for you 
to draw you in. And the ways of the world and the ways of those who want to take advantage are not going to last. You still have purpose. Our God continues to seek and make Himself known. And our God will take care of those that the shepherds do not take care of. For He has said, I will fill that role. I will take care of you. And it's interesting that uh, this passage that I read doesn't much mention the shepherds except for the fact that God said, I'm stepping in now. Um, But he talks about the fat sheep and the lean sheep. And this is a way, uh, contrary to maybe how we might think of those terms in the 21st century, this isn't uh, like fat shaming or something like that. This is his way of saying there are those who are malnourished and have nothing. And this is a way for him to say, I want you to see that there is a difference that these sheep, what he says are the large sheep, these are the sheep who are taking after the shepherds that have have been uh, put in charge. The shepherds who have been saying, hey, I'm going to make sure that everything is working the way that I want it to work. And and I, I feel like this shift in the metaphor to talking about the problem with the fat sheep and the lean sheep is that the larger sheep are taking care of, or or, I'm sorry, modeling their lives after the shepherds, just taking care of themselves. They see that that's how the shepherds worked. Just leave those who are weak beside them. That's how they are. So the illustration says they're muddying up the waters, they're eating the choice food, and they're leaving everything else behind. If I go on a hike and I see a nice creek bed and I need to get across that or skip across that on some stones or whatnot, I can see that and it looks beautiful, it looks wonderful. But if I step through it and it's not rocky, but it has that nice, soft kind of silt underneath, as soon as my feet step into that water, it kicks up all that dirt and it's dirty. It no longer looks appetizing. It no longer looks like if I was in a dire need and didn't have a water bottle, I could drink from that. That is the picture he gives of what these sheep are doing. As they are taking and taking and taking, getting larger and larger based off of what others are doing. A phrase I used to hear growing up, usually in talking about like, I don't know, early 20th century songs or uh, early 20th century uh, time period, they would say, uh, we call them fat cats. People who are just taking and taking based on what others brought them. Uh, Whether they were mobsters or whether they're just business leaders that were corrupt, fat cats, just people who are taking and taking whatever people will bring them and whatever they can take from others. Same story here. There are those who say, oh, What more can I have? And God says, I will be the true shepherd to my sheep and I will speak out and have a place and have a a safe haven for those who have wondered how much longer are we going to be living under these kinds of conditions where it seems like there is nothing left for me. And the judgment that is spoken of here against those sheep The judgment that is spoken in the gospel passage that Brenda uh, uh, read is a judgment that brings justice. A judgment that brings justice. It is not just meant to punish. It is not just meant to say, oh, you weren't good enough. You're not good enough. It's a word that brings hope to those who have said, "I, I don't know how much more that I can have taken from me. It's a word of hope to those who say, how are they getting away with this again and again? Ezekiel reminds the people of God who are about to be scattered throughout the exile. When God brings you back, we are not to take on the practices of the world that say more for me and less for you. But we are supposed to be concerned for one another, lifting each other up and making sure our basic needs are taken care of. And so he says to them, I'm going to appoint for you a new shepherd. Someone who's going to model this for you. Someone who's going to actually take care of you. And he calls him the servant David. I'm going to raise up for you the servant David who is going to be your shepherd. Now I want to tell you something about David and Ezekiel. Ezekiel comes, this prophet comes hundreds of years after King David actually reigns. And so to say, I'm going to make King David your your shepherd is a way of saying, I'm going to make someone your shepherd who is like King David. 
King David and the story of, of kings and the story of the Chronicles are two different narratives that, that tell how David is, becomes king and, ha, and the legacy that he leads. He's the one who fights off the foreign armies and he's the one who raises up this nation, helps them be who they're supposed to be. People who are following after God helps really solidify and stabilize their nation. He is their hero. He is to Israel what George Washington is to America. Like he is, he is uh, uh, the, the first primary, even though he wasn't their first king, but he is the primary king for their identity. And the Lord says to the prophet, you're going to get one like him, one who marks your identity, one who will help you be a people after God's own heart. And now it's interesting that he says he's going to raise up um, a servant like David to come and be their shepherd. Because just earlier in the passage, we read that the Lord God said, I'm going to be your shepherd. It's going to be me. And it reminds me of another passage in Matthew. In the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 22, Jesus is walking with his disciples and the Pharisees come up to him and they ask him, and they're talking, there's an exchange there, and they're trying to trap Jesus and Jesus says to him, well, let, let me ask you, uh, who's the Messiah supposed to be? And the Pharisees say, well, the Messiah is going to be a, a son of David. We know this. And Jesus says, well, why is it then that David says in the 110th Psalm, the Lord said to my Lord, sit next to me. And Jesus is pointing out that according to that Psalm, it seems like the one sitting at the right hand of God is indeed related to God, is, has some kind of identity with the Lord. And so there's an understanding that the Messiah has an identity with God. And, and I think that this passage in Ezekiel is a passage that is showing us a little bit about the beginning of the understanding of what, who the Messiah was going to be. Uh, we've heard again and again whenever we talk about the life of Jesus and his fulfillment to the people that he came as the Messiah to save them, to redeem them. And they were expecting someone to come in and just kick out the Romans. And they weren't expecting someone to be as passive as he was. They weren't expecting someone to defeat sin and defeat evil through the cross. They were expecting a sword. And part of that history of expectation of the Messiah comes in passages like this one we've read in Ezekiel chapter 34. God says, I'm going to raise up a shepherd. It's going to come from the, my servant David, and he's going to take care of you. And they heard this, and they said, like David? Like David? Okay. We're expecting this Messiah. Let's go. Let's do this. But I think just like the 110th Psalm that says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, I'll make your enemies a footstool. So in the same way, Ezekiel 34, on the one hand, says it's going to be the King David, but it also says, it's going to be the Lord God who is your shepherd. And what we find in Jesus Christ, indeed, is the embodiment of God who has said, I have been seeking after you. I've had a plan and a purpose for you and your life. I have seen you when you've been at your weakest. I've seen you when you've been at your most desperate. I've seen when you didn't know what was going to happen next. And I've been with you and I care for you. And I'm here for you now. Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah for us, and the great shepherd that he has for each and every one of us to guide us as we navigate life. The rest of this uh, chapter in 34 is our verses about a second chance for the people of God. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 34 has just, what we read just showed that, uh, you know, there is, there, there's a place of warning for those who take advantage of others, for those uh, who, have, who have hurt God's people. And there's a word of hope for those who have, who have endured that. But as Ezekiel's prophecy is going to continue and they're going to realize, okay, there's hard times ahead, yet there is a promise of God calling them back together. I'm going to read this just for a moment. Let's, um, I don't have the words for you, so just hear these words. I will make with them a covenant of peace. Banish wild animals from the land, so they may live in the wild and sleep in the woods securely. I'll make them and the region around my hill a blessing. I'll send down the showers in their season, and they shall be showers of blessing. 
The trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield its increase. They shall be secure on their soil, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I break the bars of their yoke and save them from the hands of those who enslave them. They shall no more be plunder for the nations, nor shall the animals of the land devour them. They shall live in safety, and no one shall make them afraid. I'll provide for them a splendid vegetation so that they shall no more be consumed with hunger in the land and no longer suffer the insults of the nations. They shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord God. You are my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, and I am your God, says the Lord God. On this last moment the words you just heard. They're words of encouragement without qualification. He's giving a second chance to all of his sheep. He's giving a second chance to those who have felt like they've never had a chance in the first place because they've been taken advantage of. He's giving a second chance to those who have said, oh, but I've made some mistakes. I, I haven't walked straight and narrow a good deal of my life. To that, Jesus says, or the Lord says in Ezekiel, the Lord says, but there is a second chance. There is a future in which all my children are brought together into a promise that God has for us. And what we find in Jesus Christ is indeed the beginning of the promise of eternal life, of freedom from sin, of freedom from its powers, freedom from its temptation to live like the shepherds have taught us. And we've had some pretty, pretty shady shepherds I don't just necessarily mean the church. I, I mean, if I just said politics, you're like, yeah, yeah, we have. <laughs> right? We've had some where we go, yep, yeah, they just want to feed themselves. They just want to undercut those who seem to be getting, too, uh, getting in the way. They just want to feed themselves, and everyone else just gets the slim pickings. And sometimes the temptation is, oh, that's how we're supposed to do business. Oh, that's how we're supposed to act. Oh, that's how I get ahead in this world. And, and the Lord says through the prophet Ezekiel, I have a plan for my people in which we live according to the way that the shepherd from the line of David has shown. The way of Jesus. And indeed, all of my people will be brought in and you will be absolutely taken care of. And today I want to say in light of the prayer requests that have come my way, in light of whatever it is that we might bring to a service, in light of these kinds of moments, hear indeed the word of the Lord from our pastor of scripture. Our Lord is with you. You are still His chosen. He is your Lord. He is your God. He will stay with you. He has been seeking after you. And we are called to receive His grace, to receive what the Lord Jesus Christ wants to do for each one of us, to recognize who He is as shepherd, as king, as Lord, as first priority in our life, and reap the benefits that the Lord gives and the Lord bestows because of that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for um, this Sunday where we remember that you are the God who has whispered to each one of us, it does not matter what the past has been, I have a new future for you. You are the God who has come to us and said, I bring forgiveness, I bring redemption. And Heavenly Father, it is just my hope that we would find indeed that the past no longer needs to haunt, that the sin no longer needs to enslave, but we can be saved and rescued, and we can be given hope and a purpose. Thank you again for this time of remembering that you are the God, the King, the Lord, who doesn't just sit up on high, but is absolutely enamored with each and every one of us and has been seeking us out since the beginning. And so, Lord, help us to uh, walk faithfully, to what you have called us to be. May you be glorified in that, and may we find indeed that uh, your justice is being done in this world, and that we are looking out for those whom you've called us to look out for. Thank you again for this time. Thank you again uh, for your love and grace in our life. I pray these things in Jesus' name. And now let us pray the prayer he taught uh, his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Today we come to the table to receive uh, communion. It is, um, it is the last supper that... Uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, um, our shepherd, our king, had with his disciples. He invites us to receive it. It is God's grace for us. It is our second chance. It is the promise and hope that we would join in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you are invited to that promise. Come forward and receive God's grace. This bread represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was broken for you. May he preserve you blameless unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance and be thankful. This cup of juice represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink this in remembrance and be thankful. Let's sing the hymn, Open Our Eyes, Lord.
Before we sing the benediction, just remember you are invited to join us after the service for, for sandwich, for brief, brief food, and then uh, to help uh, set up the sanctuary for our Advent season. You're welcome to stay. The Lord bless you and keep you. May you find indeed that his love extends to you. May his spirit open up our eyes to see that he is found in all those around us. May we extend grace and his peace to those who need it. Amen.